These robots are lingo droids. These robots are lingo droids and they're in their natural environment, they're language learning robots and they're in an office. So what you just heard was a conversation between two robots for words that they have invented for themselves. Okay, there was an initial greeting and then they named the location where they are and then there was a, a conclusion. So if I just replay you that name. Okay, what we do is so that we can understand what they're doing is translate that into a two-syllable word, piso, pronounceable non-word. Believe it or not, there is a whole field of research in robot languages. This is just one of the species and this is a convention so we can understand the languages. They're evolving their own language. Okay, what do they do with it? What they're doing is each one of them knows where it is in space, it's associating this word piso with that location. And the reason it can do it is because they have a sense of where they are. They have a sense of space. They have a sense of space because they have a biologically inspired cognitive system based on the little fellow on the right here. It's a rodent and deep in its brain is a type of cell called a place cell. When the robots move in space and come back, that cell will fire every time they're in the same location. Think about what it means to have a sense of space. It's not something like hearing, vision or touch. If you, if you see an object and the object moves, space is the same. So your senses have changed, but space is not. There are two great traditions on space from the uh, ancient philosophers. One is that there is a fabric and space against, um, against this fabric objects exist, objects move. The other is that there is no fabric. It's just the uh, relationships between objects in the world. Socrates and Plato differed on which they thought was correct. In the 17th century, the mathematicians Leibniz and Newton differed. It's possible that two different parts of your brain differ. And that it's actually the case that it's very useful to have the stability of space and the place cells help you with that and to also have the notion of relationships. So, what I want to do is show you how you can use a place cell to create a map. This is 20 minutes of a robot exploring the world, linking the places it's been into paths and then the paths into the map. That's 20 minutes compressed to 12 seconds. The robot here is a small robot called an IRAP. Now, it's very useful to have small robots when we do our language work. The big robots are, are great, they explore the environment, but these ones we can actually get the overhead view. They can run unsupervised and they're robots. When they crash into walls, they don't make as much mess. Okay, so we have two different robots. We want to have a conversation. We put one in the environment, have it create a map. We've got the one, the blue robot has created its map. The red robot has created its map. It's important to realize these are individual. They're recognizably the same environment, but they're from its own experience. So. What we want is for them to have conversations, to be able to name places in space. The interesting thing about this map is that it's from the um, uh, 17th century. The cartographer has drawn in the regions it knows, but there are regions it doesn't know. And often in the old maps, they would put fantastic creatures, dragons and uh, sea, sea serpents. We would like our robots to be able to talk about not just where they know, but also about where there are dragons. Okay, so how do we do that? We put the two together into the environment. Why are they exploring space and time? It's because it's the foundations of cognition, really. Okay, so what they do is they explore. Here they are coming together. When they meet each other, they stop and they have a conversation called, where are we? This is from the perspective of the red IRAT. So it knows where it is. 
they create a word. If they have a word already, they use that. Otherwise, they create one. This one's Gifu. And then they go off exploring again. Eventually, they will meet again. They play another game. And they do it again, sped up, of course, so that we can see meeting for the third time. OK, now they have three words. Place names are called toponyms, topo, topology, nim, name. The question is, they've associated these with places in their own maps, but are they useful? So instead of having conversations, we can actually do a test and find out what the robot thinks Cesar means. So if they start somewhere and they say, let's go to Cesar, we will find out where they think Cesar is in the world. They wander off, they navigate independently, they get to a certain point, they say, I think I'm here, if that's close enough. We have two things. We know that their understanding is coherent, and we know that these words are useful. So, we've got places that they experience together in name. How can a robot name unknown places? We need a different type of game for that. We're going to use how far games. So the question with how far is a distance, it's different from a toponym, it's different from a place name. There are different ways that you could get a sense of distance. You could, they could travel it themselves. In this particular case, what they're going to do is sit in the same place and talk about two locations they know. So Cesar to Piso, and they're going to name that Gohi. They can name a couple of other places and do it again, and they'll end up with three different distance words, which they link to their own experience. OK, the second type of relational word is what direction. Now, directions are really fascinating. In, in English, we can use north, south, east, and west. We can use left and right. We tend to use the cardinal directions for the larger world, left and right for us. If, if I ask you, could you look left? The question is, which way would you look? If you look to your left, you'll all be looking this way. If you look to my left, you'll be looking this way. It's ambiguous, and it's ambiguous for our robots as well. It turns out there are cultures and languages that do not use left and right at all. Uh, in the centre of Australia, if you go to the centre of Australia and head a bit northwest in the desert, there is a, a language called Walpuri. Um, these are indigenous people who are very in tune with their environment. They know when the sun comes up, the sun goes down. They use pretty much the cardinal directions instead of left and right. So they wouldn't be talking about left. They would be saying, turn north. And we would all know exactly which way to turn. My north hand, and if I turn, my north hand has become my south hand. So we want something that's as unambiguous as the cardinal directions but the robots don't have a compass and as convenient as left and right. So what we do is we use the direction Cesar facing Piso as the, the orienting, and then when it turns towards Gifu, it can then define a direction. So Rigu is an amount where the robot has turned in a given direction. It can do it again, and it can, it can define three different what directions. Now it's got distance and direction terms, it can do something really interesting. You can start at Gifu, facing Cesar, and instead of defining another word, it can use one of its relational terms, Riku, and see where it turns up if it travels, Depu. And in this particular case, they can define a place where they have both been individually, but the conversation has linked that together. Peko can now form part of the conversation. So from Gifu facing Peko, they can turn a larger amount, travel, and now they've got to a place where there are dragons. This is outside the environment. They can name this place. So the first thing is their language has enabled them to name places where they haven't been, they can't even get to. They could continue this further, entirely infinite plane, going further out. It's a very generative language. But they can do something else that's interesting. This is an imaginary word. They can use it to start a conversation from there and come back into the world. And if they end up near a location they know and they agree on this, we've got the imaginary working in with the real and we can know that their imaginary world is coherent as well. Okay, so there are many other ways we could talk about space, but I want to turn to time. In every culture, time is understood through metaphors. We talk about life as a journey. 
Time is another country. Time is interesting if we want, how can you teach a robot time? Now robots have clocks, clocks are very useful. But if you want to meet someone at sunset, if the robots want to meet at sunset, clock time is actually quite confusing. They could calculate it for today, but later in the year, if they get lots of different experiences and they record it in clock time, it's going to be problematic because there's nothing coherent that they can attach it to. So what we want them to do is to use events in the world to name time rather than the clock that they carry with them. We do this by having them notice the sunlight levels. So at the moment, they're having a conversation about what time is it. It's very bright outside. They're going to invent the word zeu. As it gets darker, this is through the afternoon, they invent words for afternoon, for dusk, one for night. Now, dawn. Dusk and dawn are actually different. The light levels are the same, but dawn the light is rising. So we're actually having them notice not just the light levels, but also the direction of change of light levels. And then they've got morning and back to zero again. So what they've created is a cyclic notion of time that's grounded in the world, that's connected to the, their experience of the world. Again, we can ask the question, are these words useful? And like the go-to games, we can do meet at games. So they can say meet at Kippa and choose a location like Cesar. And then we, have a, we check where they turn up and when they turn up. If they turn up at the same time, in the same place, then they have a coherent and a useful language. OK, so time and space are the foundations of what we've been working with. Where to next? The world has over 6,000 languages. By the end of this century, over half of them will no longer be spoken. What we would like is for our robots to have the ability to learn any one of those languages. Now, it's not just an academic exercise. Every child on the planet has that ability. Why not our robots as well? It should be no harder than learning one language. It's also very useful because when the robots learn another language, what they learn from that language helps us break our assumptions about our own. And then we bring back into our own culture, into our own language, things that improve the robot's ability to learn in our own language. So one of the ones in particular is multiculturalism. Nick Evans is a linguist who wrote um, a fantastic book called Dying Words, and he talks about the fact that many of the world's people are multilingual. In fact, in some families, you cannot marry your own language group into your own language group, which means everyone in the family will be multilingual. We wanted to try this out with our robots. We had a bit of fun having an infant robot, two different parents, and the infant had to learn from both of the parents. It works surprisingly well, provided one thing. The infant must know who it's talking to. So up till now, I've been talking about robots with the same bodies and the same brains. In the future, we're going to have heterogeneous robots. We're also going to have robots talking with us, and we won't have the same bodies, and we don't have the same brains. So here, we have a study, one of our recent studies, where the robot on the uh, north side, north-hand side, is uh, the traditional uh, IRAT robot. It has a camera. It creates paths in the world. The one on the left uses a laser. It doesn't have vision at all, and it creates a very different representation of the world. These robots actually evolve a language that's productive and coherent. They have different bodies, they have different minds. But one thing that was really essential that they need is they need the same or similar social skills. One of the surprising things that comes out of robot language work is the importance of the social. And I want to highlight two particular social skills. One is timing. The robots know they're in a conversation together because of the relative timing. And we know we're in conversation because of fractions of a second we detect the differences in who we're speaking to. The second one is they need to pay attention to the same topic, whether that topic is an event, space, time, distance, whatever. Attention and language have a very deep connection. If you take a child, an infant with a new toy, and they're playing with the toy, and kids tend to bring it up to their face, 
So they're looking at it and they hear a new word. They will tend to associate that word with the toy that they're paying attention to at the time. That's what our robots are doing in the way that they're learning as well. So the lingo droids uh, have an ability to in invent words because Ruth Schultz gave them conversations about space and Scott Heath gave them conversations about time. David Ball created the beautiful IRAT robot. UQ's science communicators created the environment for us. Um, and Michael Milford and Gordon Wyeth developed the fantastic mapping system that underpins their skills. It takes people from a lot of different disciplines to make robots talk. And I thank them all, and I thank you. <laughs>